can't really get to know the patients as much as you wanted to because you don't get to like sit close and like spend time with them like you usually would. Some Humber nursing students take their learning to the front lines. We talk to one. Humber's North Campus may look like a ghost town. We take a look at life in residence. And some cyclists in the city are bridging the gap to deliver essential supplies. Humber News starts now. Hello, and welcome to Humber News, coming to you with this, our last virtual newscast for the semester from Humber College. I'm JB Martinito. And I'm Kristen Custon. It's Friday, March 5th, and here's what's making news. Ontario released its updated COVID-19 vaccine rollout plan today. A number of developments caused the vaccine task force to amend the province's vaccine strategy. That's right, Kristen. Today, Health Canada approved the one-shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And last week, the agency gave a go-ahead for AstraZeneca. And the National Advisory Committee on Immunization has said that for both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, the provinces can safely extend the time between shots up to four months. Moving out of the stay-at-home order is a reasonable course of action. The gray zone allows retail businesses to open at 25% capacity. There can be no indoor organized public events and social gatherings except with members of the same household and one person who lives alone. And outdoor gatherings cannot exceed 10 people. So far, 784,828 Ontarians have been given at least one shot of the vaccine. 40% of Canadians over 80 now have at least one dose, yet only 2.9% of Canadians are vaccinated, ranking Canada 42nd in the world. The online portal, meant to be set up weeks ago, now has a launch date of March 15th. Public health units, along with hospitals, pharmacies and primary care professionals, are in collaboration to carry out the project. The chair of the COVID-19 Vaccine Distribution Task Force, General Rick Hillier, says Ontario healthcare units have gone through several different scenarios and challenges to prepare for the process. My complete confidence was in making an assessment. They are ready to go. In the past week, there have been 7,590 new cases and 121 deaths. Hospitalizations have decreased by 3%. The premiers also held a virtual conference this week to demand a significant increase in the unconditional transfer payment the federal government sends provinces and territories each year for health care. This year, premiers want Ottawa to increase its share from 35%. Now that's 7% more compared to the previous years. Premiers also have the intention to increase $4 billion in the following years. Quebec Premier Marcel Ligot ran the press conference that brought together all premiers and territorial leaders. If the federal doesn't increase the transfer, there's a risk provinces and territories won't be able to pay for all the services their population need. At the end of the day, it's the most vulnerable people who'll suffer. Provinces and territories are currently paying 78% of health costs, and this proportion increases every year. The premiers say they need stable and predictable funding for their health systems, which were already facing challenges before the pandemic. Nursing is no doubt one of the toughest professions to be in right now, even for seasoned workers. And nursing programs across the country have students learning on the job in these high-risk environments, including students from Humber's very own nursing program. Some nursing students are dealing with the pandemic from the front lines. Many students are completing clinical placements at some of the highest risk facilities like walk-in clinics and hospitals. But one Humber student placed at a long-term care home says, despite not receiving the vaccine, she and her fellow students feel well protected by strict COVID-19 protocols and regular testing. I was worried at first, but after I saw how, how good they are with um, their social distancing and like where they're on our COVID tests. I'm not that worried anymore. And Full personal protective equipment is required at all times. Social distancing must be maintained by all residents and among staff. And Keen says students are required to provide negative COVID-19 test results weekly. Any public health delays on test results can mean missing training shifts. I, get, um, I got my COVID test, but they didn't get, I didn't get the results in time. So I wasn't able to go to my first week, which really sucked because I was behind and everything. And then you had to catch up and um, the place. Keen says there. clinical teachers are providing students with everything needed to be prepared for the front line. COVID-19 protocols are strong and in replacement of some hands-on experience. 
Meanwhile, at Humber North Campus, the halls and classrooms for the most part are empty, but some students continue to live on campus in residence, including our Humber News reporter Lilia Smichenko. She gives us a look inside life in residence these days. Although the number of incoming international students has dropped significantly, some still come to Humber the first chance they get. Right now, North Campus residence has fewer than 200 students, which means only 20% of the building is occupied. Life on campus drastically changed over the last year to ensure the safety of its residents. But residence feels quite empty at this point and there's not much uh, live interaction going on. No social gatherings are allowed. All common areas are closed, including the seating area at the cafeteria, which used to be the main socializing place for students. Well, some of the challenges are definitely maybe making some connections uh, and just feeling like you're home. That would be the greatest challenge. Making connections for international students is particularly important while being away from family and friends. Students try to stay connected through social media and virtual events held by resident staff. I live in residence here myself and I can tell you things really have changed. People stay in their own rooms and no one has roommates and everyone has to follow strict COVID protocol. This is Lydia Smichenko, Humber News. Humber's new international graduate school did open this winter, offering limited programs with classes remotely. The school is hoping to expand its offerings as the pandemic restrictions are lifted. With the launch of programs for international students in January, Humber looks to ensure that those looking to advance their career can do so. Students with a bachelor's degree or advanced educational credentials can complete graduate certificates in a year or two's time. Once in-person learning returns, students will be able to access study spaces, advanced technology, learning commons areas, and new classrooms. While this has not been ideal, we have tried to create um, a community of learners through the International Graduate School, through, through the virtual platforms that we have uh, available to us. These programs offered at Humber's other campuses will provide business, financial, and technology-related credentials. If students look to further their studies, credits from their program can be used towards a master's degree with Humber's global partners. Humber sports and facilities remain closed off to the public. The leagues will hold a meeting in the coming weeks to discuss plans to reopen Ontario College Athletics. Humber News reporter Jeremy Uden sat down with Humber Sports Information and Marketing Coordinator Brian Lepp to give us an update. Humber's gym and athletic facilities remain closed to the public. Brian Lepp, Humber Sports Information and Marketing Coordinator, sat down with Humber News to give us an update. Everyone's kind of just waiting to see how the vaccinations go, how they're uh, implemented, uh, really what happens during the summer. Because the, the last thing they want to do is, you know, cancel the season ahead of time, right? Because like, like what they want to do is give people a chance to get places to stay, um, enroll in school, that kind of stuff, right? But at the same time, you don't want to leave it last second and then tell everybody, okay, the season's canceled, right? So it's really the league is trying to do, and uh, they have meetings coming up uh, that they have every year, and uh, they'll be discussing it further. But as of right now, it's just a wait and see. If we all have the vaccine by September, is it possible to get sports going before the year ends? A very slim, very slim, because, uh, there's, there's so many logistics, not just about sports, it's about, um, you know, where they're going to live, where they're going to stay. So you need, you need to have spots for these kids. They need to be able to have money to pay for all this stuff, right? So there, there's a lot on the students, too, by making a last-second decision. I believe if they do return, you know, you, you'll see less fans in the crowd. Um, you'll see more separation. You'll see uh, masks, obviously. Um a lot of sanitizing of game equipment and balls during, before, during, and after. Your winner and new three-point competition champion, Dwayne Lambert Cador. Humber Athletics did hold a three-point contest with men's basketball over the weekend 
keeping with high restrictions and low capacity. Hawks guard Dwayne Lambert Cador sank a money ball on the last rack to take home the trophy. The contest was strictly educational. Its sole purpose? To give broadcast radio and TV students the practitional experience they haven't gone in months. The gym's only other uses since the pandemic has been a space for learning therapy and policing. Women's basketball will be holding their three-point contest Friday at 4 p.m. You can watch it on Hawk Sports Network. A historic moment for Canada as federal members of Parliament agreed to pass the motion that officially marks February 22nd as National Human Trafficking Awareness Day. Both Ontario and Alberta have recognized this day for several years. Canada is only now spreading the awareness across the country with hopes of educating Canadians on the dangers of human trafficking. Premier Doug Ford said that Ontario has become a hot spot for human trafficking with the highest numbers of police reported incidents in the country in 2019. We will not allow this to continue here in Ontario. This new bill proposes to strengthen the ability of children's aid societies and law enforcement to protect exploited children in many new ways. The Premier also announced a five-year investment of $307 million as part of the government's anti-human trafficking strategy. The Government of Canada released a new campaign video demonstrating that human trafficking can be very complex and can happen in your very own relationship. Statistics Canada numbers show 28% of all trafficking victims in the country are under 18, while the average age for new victims targeted by traffickers is just 13 years old. A reality that Timia Nagy knows too well, a victim of trafficking in Canada when she was only 21. Once you become a victim of human trafficking, it will take a lifetime to heal from it. It will take at least 10 years, at the very least, to start to rebuild your life. Human trafficking includes recruiting, transporting, or holding victims to exploit them, generally for sexual purposes or labor. A good Samaritan who started building tiny shelters to help those in need is facing legal battles with Toronto City officials. But advocates who support the carpenter and his tiny shelters have something to say to Mayor John Tory. About 800 people took part in a protest this past weekend to demand that the city drop an application for a court injunction against a Toronto carpenter who has built dozens of tiny shelters for unhoused people. Protesters left notices on a cardboard cutout of Mayor Tory outside his condo. The notices indicate that the protesters support residents of encampments in city parks and oppose the application filed in the Ontario Superior Court on February 12 against Khalil Seawright. Seawright started building tiny shelters to provide temporary warm spaces to those experiencing homelessness during the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. The carpenter is now asking the City of Toronto to stop filing injunctions against him and instead focus on finding a solution for long-term housing for those experiencing homelessness. For those who call into the shelter system again and again and can't find a safe place to sleep, People who rely on the shelter system no longer trust it. The city's reputation is terrible when it comes to providing safe and available shelters. We need to work together to support our vulnerable residents. The officials filed the injunction against Seawright to stop building the wooden structures and illegally placing them on city property. The city has invested in resources to help reduce the homeless population by relocating those without a housing to the city's new modular housing programs. With COVID-19 front and center on everyone's mind, a group of Toronto bikers are doing everything they can to help others. They call themselves the Bike Brigade. JB and I spent some time with them this week and she has more to the story. Rain or shine, Toronto cyclists are peddling products through the pandemic. Known as the Bike Brigade, these cyclists come decked out in full gear and aren't afraid of a little snow. Bungee cords, helmets, crates, some hand sanitizer, and of course, a set of wheels are all these cyclists need to stay operational all year long. It isn't hard to find willing bikers in Toronto with a large cycling community eager to ride for the cause. Sean Kalaki has been with the Bike Brigade since last spring, sometimes doing five deliveries in a day. Everyone that you meet is so, so has so much gratitude and, 
and uh, it's really nice to feel that uh, sense of helping others and, and, and being, being able to provide them with something that everyone needs. Community lawyer and founder David Shelnut's Toronto office doubles as a makeshift distribution center for daily deliveries. While the bike brigade formed in response to the pandemic, Shelnut says he's just fortunate to serve in solidarity with the organizations he calls pillars of the community. Uh, and what we learned from them and what we learned from just observing uh, how the pandemic was affecting people is that these problems that are we're facing right now are systemic in nature and existed before the pandemic. What the pandemic has done is just highlighted them. Partnering with organizations like Food Share, the Bike Brigade delivers essential supplies to vulnerable and isolated community members. After nearly a year, his fleet of cyclists has grown to about 800 riders covering up to 600 kilometers across Toronto each week. Well, Kristen, you know what they say, not all heroes wear capes. In this case, they wear their bike helmets. Yeah, you know, that was really nice to see in film firsthand. I mean, that day alone, they delivered 117 food share boxes. Wow, and I can't believe the Bike Brigade is coming up to its one year anniversary. I know, most of us have spent the year at home, but they've been out every single day. Well, you can keep up with what they're doing on Instagram by following them at The Bike Brigade. That's all for us today. I'm JB Martinito. And I'm Kristen Cusson. Humber News is written and produced by students in the journalism program. For more coverage, visit our website, humbernews.ca, and follow us on Twitter at HumberJRNL. We'll see you again next time.